Dr. Vergés, who you see here, is accompanied by the person who made this meeting possible in June of 2017, a man who I don't know if the Spanish health care uh, will ever appreciate uh, Mr. Carlos Letts. A round of applause for him, please. Subdirector General of the Ministries of uh, Services and the Ministry of Health, Dr. Vergés called him and said, Dr. Lenz, we would like you, if possible, to, we'd like you to uh, hear us out, hear about this uh, a organization, OAFI, and he welcomed it. And, well, if you'll allow me, Ricardo, you introduced it very nicely. Dr. Carlos Lenz is an excellent person, a dear friend, one of the first who I spoke with about creating an association of patients, and he said, yes, absolutely, it's necessary. From the ministry, in the subdirectorate of uh, services, he has been subdirector of the Spanish Medicines Agency, an extraordinary person, uh, an extraordinary professional, and a good writer and pharmacologist. So someone who I would like to be like. Um, the presentation of WAFI was done in the Ministry of Health in the Ernest Uke Hall, uh, a luxury, very successful. He's someone very important because from the very beginning, he saw the need you know, for us to create OAFI, and he helped us very much, especially in moments in life in which you have doubts and uh, you enter in a world of unknown. And um, he supported us from the very beginning, and I want to thank him for it publicly. So you have the floor. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Dr. Vergés. Thank you, Ricardo, for your kind introduction. Let me um, talk with some slides, please. I have to say that when my friend Joseph Vergés said, asked if I could speak in this meeting about regulatory agencies and the regulation of uh, drugs, I thought of a set of objectives, and I'm very pleased that he remembered those years when we discussed, and I had the honor of participating conceptually in the foundation of uh, OAFI. I thought it was necessary to organize patients' associations, and for that, we need strong associations, robust associations, with uh, projection. That is why what I will share with you now is aimed at basically what associations of patients must know, and patients as well, because we all are patients. Since we are born, what should they know about regulatory bodies and what criticism can we um, say about them and how to improve them? No doubt in the 200 years in which pharmacology has been around as a science since Friedrichson Turner at the beginning of the 19th century identified morphine, isolated it, uh, called it uh, according to the god of sleep, Morpheus. Since then, there have been many advances in pharmacology. We have over 5,000 active ingredients in the history of pharmacology. The changes in the health of the world population are, for the great part, due to these medicines. I would say up to the 70s of the 20th century, medicines 
had contributed greatly if we think of anesthetics, which uh, allowed us to uh, evolve in surgery, or we could think of vaccines up to the end of the 19th century. The main cause of death amongst the human population was diphtheria, and the first Sarah, uh, thanks to Agu, Cyril, Pasteur, they started changing the prognosis of this disease. It took 50 years, but obviously, if we compare the situation now with back then, we are doing much better. But it was after the 70s, up to the 70s, the improvements in ventilation, in heating, uh, chlorinated water, advances in town planning, the improvement of uh, uh, agricultural production, they all had an impact on the quality of life and our health comparable to that of medicine and uh, drugs. But since then, the speed at which medicine and pharmacology has advanced has moved much, much faster than the others that I mentioned. So let's move in. La, en la charla que nos reúne hoy, que to today's lecture on agencies and the reg regulation of drugs. Why do we have to uh, regulate medicines? The origin is very clear. We have to remember the disaster with thalidomide and the disaster of some solvents leading to hepatosis, like ethylene glycol and other episodes that took governments to adopt very drastic positions because they had not considered regulating medicines till then. For example, in Spain, back then, with the disaster of thalidomide, we were, we had our regulations of 1860 in terms of pharmacology. A hundred years had gone by with a regulatory framework, which with two world wars, and all the technological changes, uh, it was obsolete. So we needed a structured uh, renovation and a structuring of drugs. And this led to the creation of the agencies that are of several types. But something that people don't know is that agencies don't act on their own. There is a supranational organization, not uh, formally structured. It is the International Conference of Harmonization, ICS. And this started depending on the EFTA, the uh, European Free Trade Agreement, then it went to the World Trade Organization, and now it's almost a virtual uh, association made up by hundreds of working groups who ensure that advances in science, not just medicine or biology, also technological areas like engineering, mathematics, um, computer science, ensuring that they have an ordered impact on the knowledge of medicines and the requisites um, that they need to authorize and keep them in the market. There are agencies, there's uh, some supranational agency, one which is very important, the European Medicines Agency, which is now in Amsterdam, in Holland, since the Brexit, when in the 90s it was created, it was in London in 1993. The EMA is not an agency in itself, 
with it does have structure and staff and buildings it doesn't have labs the task basically is to coordinate the network of European agencies and this is the great strength of the agencies in the EU if we think of the how close it is to the scientific groups of the 27 member states uh, there is a cooperation coordination uh, mechanism that benefits all the citizens of the European Union lo importante es que hay agencias nacionales y son en la unión so, very robust structures in the EU, outside of the EU as well, especially the Food and Drug Administration and many others, mostly from developed countries. But in any case, we have to say that at a given point in my experience uh, in the ministry, I led some auditors to see the Latin American uh, medicines agencies, and we found a high level in those institutions. I don't want to uh, highlight any of them. That was an initiative of the Oaxaca group, and at the end of the first decade this century, the audits had been done with excellent levels for many of these sister agencies. In very small countries, they have uh, strong agencies, uh, except for developing countries with great difficulties because their priorities politically and economically and socially are others. In general, in the developed world, there are very good agencies and the best of them all is their willingness to cooperate. There are global agencies, few, that act in all the areas of medicines, like the Italian IFA, the Portuguese Infarmed, not in the case of Spain. The Spanish Medicines Agency is responsible of medicines for humans, uh, animals, and healthcare products, but it's not competent for economic or uh, funding uh, matters that we will speak about for a few minutes. Some agencies have structured, uh, varied structures, but they practically all coincide in uh, their tasks. I'm not going to bore you here with everything that's done, because the next slide. Saber un poco de, de, de modo más útil, más más sencillo el. What do uh, agencies do with uh, regards to the uh, life cycle of medicine? For the journal part, it is uh, the public powers that intervene, and the agencies are the regulators in this context. If we look back at the regulatory frameworks, we have to speak of the three criteria presiding the authorization of a drug and its maintenance in the market, because many times we believe that once the medicine is approved or authorized, all is done, but there's still very much to do. As I said, regulators have to supervise everything before the drug gets to market, before it's available for patients, and after as well. And I don't want to forget in this context, besides the three basic requisites, efficacy, safety, and quality, there is a fourth requisite of 2002 by the WHO, which is that drugs have to be accessible to all patients. This is a goal that we are far from achieving for several reasons not just economical reasons. Cuando la respuesta sencilla de que claro, el que más eh, el que más PIB per capita tiene
uh, one with more uh, per capita uh, GDP will have better medication? Yes, but no. The United States has very high levels. It's not the highest in the world. There are other countries that are even better, but medicines there are not accessible for many uh, social levels for several reasons, not just economic reasons. I mean, there are even many problems with uh, forged medicines, although the FDA is an excellent agency. Anyway, what's the role of agencies before an authorization of a drug when whoever wants to develop the um, drug wants to authorize its commercialization. They have to think of the requisites that the regulator will demand before moving on to the next step. Not so much commercialized, but before we take the first step. So discovering a drug could be more or less accessible to research qualified groups. It could even be patented. One of the great debates nowadays with the pandemic, um, questioning whether we should patent uh, vaccines against COVID. Happily, patent patents are since 1998 included in the APIC agreement which apply worldwide, except for some rebel countries, to the most fundamental international cooperation standards like paying the foreign debt. So since 1998, these agreements on uh, intellectual, industrial intellectual property are applied and implemented worldwide. And we are seeing that every year, just the EMA, has 60, 70 new drugs authorized only in the European Union so that you have an idea of the importance of having these plans and protection plans that make it attractive to discover new drugs. Once we go beyond this phase and we want to investigate, we have to start thinking of a set of guidelines that will preside the investigation of the drug toxicology, a lethal dose, a subacute or acute toxicity. Happily, many times it's done with algorithms that prevent the suffering and death of many uh, laboratory experimental animals. The figures are much less than 50 years ago where it wouldn't be rare to sacrifice 10,000 rodents only in toxicity tests. The same applies with experimental preclinical pharmacological models and then when we consider running the clinical trial, this includes many elements, ethics as well as the rights of the person. The more vulnerable the person, the more rights there are to protect, and the more institutions try to protect those rights at the same time, uh, fostering, encouraging the investigation process, because there's very much to do still in pharmacology. But once we have uh, reached these phases, many candidates to medicines do not succeed um, after the authorization. The drug is taken to market. The stakeholders have to be told about that new drug. And here I want to uh, mention that about 10 years ago, there was almost a change in the legal regulations of the EU regulating the information of prescription drugs uh, for patients. Nowadays, 
there's a regulation on the advertisement and uh, information to healthcare professionals. Uh, advertisement to the public in general of drugs that don't require prescription, but to date you cannot do widespread and structured information on new drugs. It basically depends on uh, the media which, uh, although it's healthy, it should deserve to be structured more. Then we have pharmacovigilance. Agencies are very active in pharmacovigilance. Don't forget that adverse effects of a drug could be very frequent, frequent, low frequency, rare, and very rare, depending on whether the incidence goes from 10% to one in every 10,000. So the adverse effects that are very rare need the patients to be used in dozens of thousands of patients for that to be noted. And pharmacovigilance as a science, pharmacoepidemiology can capture those adverse effects, systematize, analyze them, establish cause-effect relations, and finally incorporate them in the knowledge of the drug. If we know the adverse effects better, it means they will be safer. They will be authorized with more safety because we know what is to be expected of them. So we shouldn't be surprised or, or scared. On the contrary, we should know that the more, the better in the adverse effects listed in, uh, concerning every drug. But there are many other things, like information treatment techniques allow us to analyze the real uh, life. It's a pleasure to work with hospitals now in which there are clinical pharmacology departments with new technologies. You can screen through uh, dozens of thousands of clinical histories and seeing the effects of uh, drugs on a uh, big part of our health in a few seconds. These are real-life studies, and they contribute very much, and they are changing the scenario for pharmacology. But there are incidents, inspections need to be carried out, the technique changes every day, good manufacturing practices too. All of these things change. Knowledge changes on many physical phenomena. And in general, all of the this knowledge must be applied to the manufacturing of drugs. We can say that upon the expiry of the patent of a drug, the status of the quality of the invention is not similar to the one at the time that drug was discovered or authorized for use in, pa in patients. All of these functions will be developed by an agency, by a regulator, and they will be set out in the regulation of drugs. Shall we change slides now? And something important, whether we some we take it for granted because we live in a welfare state and most countries in the European Union have welfare economy, welfare state economies. So we believe that most drugs used by our doctors, those describing them in our hospitals, are given either free of charge or with a relative low payment component, especially for the most vulnerable and with lowest income, pay up to 60% of the general sales price. There's a financing of the drug system that is separated from the authorization system. One can authorize a drug, but nevertheless, if it cannot be used by healthcare systems, if it's free of charge or provided as a discount. This is the case of the whole of the EU, but we must understand that this process is separated from the process of authorization and, and marketing. It's not forever. 
It entails a right so that that drug can be funded for some time. The regulators sometimes, depending on changes in therapeutic needs and in scientific knowledge, alter the context of price and financing conditions of these drugs. For instance, upon the expiry of a patent, it is deemed that the drug or that the holder of the drug has enjoyed that franchise for that time of being alone in the market and we see more competition. If it's a generic drug for a chemical-based drug or similar if it's a biological-based drug. The admission of competitors of as much or more quality than specialists, those who say that generic drugs are of lesser quality, they're not right. This admission is accompanied by decrease in prices, strong price reductions. In the case of Spain, a biosimilar or generic drug will see a decrease of 40% in price. Hospitals, since they are subject to the Public Procurement Act of public administrations, can set up tenders and some hospital drugs even decrease that price more. But it is also true that many of these drugs come from countries, the technological level of which could be improved and the social conditions of which of the workers allow for costs to be well below those of developed countries where, among other things, we have the bad taste of having a welfare state economy with pensions, unemployment benefits, and many other things. So when the state does not need to dedicate many funds to this, the state can afford low salaries. And these salaries will be a factor in the cost of production of these drugs that are not covered by a patent. What is the result? Well, many low-priced drugs, generally, these drugs come with very short Shelf dates, regulations tend to ask for two years at least. But six months before the expiry of the patent, the drug cannot be sold. So many of these manufacturers in other continents are in too much of a hurry to get rid of the first batches produced. And they release those at very low prices. And then, when they consider continuity in supply, there tend to be problems. Let's go to the one before last now. So in this context, let us see what are the challenges that the agencies have right now. Since these agencies are being pressured on a technical and scientific level, but we know the adagio of Roman law, right? The fact precedes the law. This innovation, these amendments, these new concepts must be let down in legal provisions. And in the EU, in 2004, there was a significant improvement on the regulatory framework. The was an obligation to authorize new drugs or new cases in 210 days. Up to then, it wouldn't surprise to see that a case file would be prosecuted throughout five years in a European agency or at the FDA. So the regulators, among many other things, because of pressures exerted by the European Parliament and patient associations said, this cannot be. If there is a drug that makes a significant contribution to people's health, we cannot spend five years prosecuting it with never-ending bureaucracy. So this is the reason of the 2004 review, which was in effect on 1 May that year, whereupon seven, Regulation 726C, 26 of the EU and the Parliament was approved. And that's the same date on which 
the guidelines 2001-82 and 83 on veterinary drugs and drugs for human use was approved, informing 80% uh, of the law and guarantees and use of medicines and medicinal products. The first time it was passed was in 2006, shortly after this regulation being in effect, but then in 2008, another case was started in the EU, another substantial improvement, which was the pharmaceutical package, which, as I said, it, for instance, where the control of falsified drugs in the supply chain, pharmacovigilance, it allowed each country to decide what model they wanted to follow to contribute more or less, but to benefit from the knowledge of the pharmacovigilance schemes. And based on this, today I would say that we have the system I referred to at the beginning that has elements that can be improved. We have a very sophisticated scheme, it's very specialized, it's very intricate. Sometimes we have authorities that tend to forget and they focus on the technical part and forget legal certainty, something very important. Because if there is something that defines a welfare state and a democracy, is legal certainty. And this sometimes tends to be neglected in favor or for the benefit of other positions. Sometimes we are missing assessments of high value without bias. Sometimes the assessments are full of impressions, opinions, or group interests. So there are a few things that we can improve. And now let's go to the last slide and we conclude, because this is what I wanted to get at. Patient associations Patients, in my view, play a key role. And if I look back at how we were 50 years ago, I could not say this in public or in private. It is true that the patient is the target of the drug. There are drugs because there are patients with needs. And the patient is the access around the value chain of the drug. We should know this clearly. There is no need to develop a drug if there is no need, a social one and a medical one. Having said that, let's take a leap and let's avoid intermediate stages. Do patients need to be involved in the decisions for authorization of new drugs and then in subsequent financing decisions? I will not answer that question. I will leave this to you and to the opinion of many of people that are more experts than me. But I would like to say that nowadays patients and patient associations have a level of knowledge, a structure, and an organization that has little to do with that of 50 years ago. Patient associations are the first ones to be aware of their needs. I see this in my day-to-day -day as a consultant, which I've been doing since I left the ministry more than four years ago. And I can see the seriousness with which patient associations approach very tricky issues. For instance, how can we be in favor of this drug or this other drug so that the media, the ministry, can consider that we have only partial interests, or in this case, economic interests. I see this in my daily activities. And I must say to you that there are many things to be won, not just for a drug to gain access to therapeutics sooner or later. There are things resulting from the sophistication of biomedicine and the new drugs where patients can provide their bit and share their views and it could help the technical experts and the regulators 
who sometimes forget about the human aspect, the social aspect, so that they can think, for instance, that these sophisticated drugs sometimes need support structures for the patient. And these support structures must be conceived so that that drug can generate better results amongst the patient population and not just seen as a mechanism to promote the pharmaceutical industry. I would invite any of you to see how Nowadays, we would call them socio health care, care. We're referring to treatment methods and referring to those health care products used in osteotomy and change the lives of patients subject to a colostomy many years ago. Well, nowadays, the organizations of these companies still provide support to patients so they can obtain the greatest benefit from their consumption. And there are many more things in this context to be considered. Maybe we can talk about some in our discussion, but I would like to conclude by saying that we all need more awareness, more awareness about the needs that our society and patients have. I am happy because now rare diseases with very low incidence are socially as recognized as others. And supranational authorities are the first to say that we need to provide more resources to research these drugs. And then sometimes we found ourselves with the problem that these are very expensive treatments, sometimes hundreds of thousands of euros per patient per year. But we need to consider that rare diseases have very low incidence. And sometimes producing a drug for these treatments could have taken 15 or even 20 years. I'll just leave it there. I would like to conclude the way I started. I think patient organizations in general, WAFI in particular, and I say so because I've been following you over the last 10 years, very relevant things have been achieved. So I encourage you to persevere in this line of work. Thank you very much. Well, Carlos, thank you very much. I think that you just gave us a true masterclass of how regulatory agencies work and how drugs are approved and the importance of funding. And especially, you said something that you know very well how patient associations and organizations can change and help. And we saw the Wafi case with glucosamine and others. It was the very first time in Spain that a patient association was able to put a stop to funding that made no sense at all. Now, if you have some brief question, because we're way out of time. Any question? A quick one, please? No? It needs to be very brief. Doctor, I know you tend to explain things, but and, and please remember, you come after. 30 seconds. Just one brief comment. I fully agree. The presentation was great, very detailed. But let me emphasize something that has always concerned me, which is the training of the doctor. Some patients after going to several doctors without a good result, always complain. But there was once a patient who said to me, oh, doctor, I was not fortunate. I was unfortunate because the ones lagging at the back of the class saw me. We need to raise awareness amongst regulatory agencies and the institutions that oversee the institutions that train these professionals, because we need to look for, in the same way that we've done in previous years, we need to ensure that medicine is taught the way it should to all students in at university with the same level. We want all of them to be great, not just the first ones or those sitting at the front and those at the back mediocre. Because if that is the case, 
we will continue to provide society with just a few good doctors and then others who unfortunately are not good or not because they're bad but they didn't receive so I think it's important if this could be in the mindset of agencies would you like to mainly comment on that Dr. Lenz well that's I think to consider, I said that one of the first tasks after authorizing a drug is to provide information to the interested parties. Healthcare professionals come first. There are laws and provisions since the 70s of the previous century. But I think that other than norms and rules, there are many things that are important. Medical professions, whether corporate organizations, must regulate these things. And the pharmaceutical industry, especially since the beginning of this century, there is a special sensitivity towards these issues, what is called the compliance with the rule and ethics, compliance. Some departments are specifically designated to this end, and they operate as internal auditors, preventing practices that go against medical malpractice from being carried out. I think we'll always see this, where there are so many groups with just a few percentage of people who are unethical, I think is something we will always see. And if it does reach the media, it will be ne labeled negatively and it will affect the whole profession. But this is part of the game. We need to live with it and improve daily, like in any aspect of our lives. Well, thank you very much, Carlos. A round of applause to Dr. Lenz. Thank you very much, Dr. Lenz. Dr. Lenz, we have a surprise for you. Don't get up yet. We have a surprise for you because since you don't behave very well with us, we have something for you. You know that OAFI, since last year, likes to support those who have supported the, our foundation, people who have helped a lot of people. And Dr. Lenz helped us a great deal. Many of the things that we can do today is thanks to him. So we have this thing that we call the tree of life. So this is your special tree of life. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. And I hope we can do this m for many more years to come.